Okay, we're going to look at how Paul does his meter because it tells you some really important doctrine that you can't even see unless you know the meter. Now, I've done like, you know, 20, almost 30 videos on meter and it's probably very confusing to people unfamiliar with it, which is pretty much everybody. So maybe for you this is the best place to start and then go backwards in the Psalm 90 meter of time videos and backwards in the GGS, the 10 GGS videos because that will be background to what I'm going to say now. The page before you is the title page which you know I've got it magnified so you can see it on screen each one of these you see where it's, it's highlighting the names um, that's another link inside the same document so if you're reading it in Word it's a lot easier to tool around and you'll find that these links are on each page so it's easy for you to go from one section to the other so that's kinda where I'm starting now is to let you know how to navigate this thing as you can see in the upper left hand corner it's called Ephesians 1 Reparsed the PDF version as you can see right here um, on the internet is uh, decreased syllables reparse PDF on the right hand side here uh, where, where I just put the cursor oops right here yeah highlighted black of course you can't read it um, I had to I have to keep that that name because I've been using this document for a long time so as far as navigating the document what you want to do is look for these underlines and they are links within the document or as you can see above to um, an online source of information it might be easier to do it with the documents rather than the videos at least at first and then maybe when you get confused about what the what the documents mean you go to the videos afterwards I'm sorry this is so piecemeal but I'm publishing it as I learn it because this is this is really good information it's really important uh, it's it's really revolutionary actually in hermeneutics and it needs to be tested it needs to be seen by people in authority so they themselves can you know vet it and I don't own this this is information that's in the Bible I just happen to be you know I stumbled onto it so it's going to take a long time for people to test this out and obviously I can't be a hundred percent correct here that's one of the reasons I'm disclosing it it's like okay this is what I found and then you all do what you want to do with it and have whatever arguments you want to make and I'll try the meanwhile to explain what I understand as best as I can that's pretty much how it goes but this thing here Paul is actually laying out the history the future history of church underneath the words he uses and that is actually a rhetorical style that Moses started in Psalm 90 which is why I made the Psalm 90 meter of time playlist Paul is basically doing what Moses did except he's adapting it to church he's following the same style and in many cases he's actually parsing um, Ephesians 1 3 through 14 along the same lines as Moses because people who were gonna read this at the time he gave it they would have had Psalm 90 memorized by heart by syllables because everybody orally memorized scripture in those days so he was benchmarking the syllables like Moses did so they would know where in Psalm 90 to look and he does it over and over and over again so it's not guesswork to know that that's what he's pointing at okay and you're gonna have to read this and, and really you know spend a lot of time on it unfortunately if God wants you to do that in order to see that what I'm saying is true all I can do is document it and it's it's a lot of material to go through so you know if, if this kind of stuff is not what God wants you to focus on right now then don't focus on it okay but if you are to focus on it that's why I'm making this video so again the first page you've got links like this is how God orchestrates time this like saves you time understanding all my videos on it what is the doctrine what is it because this isn't known to Christendom so as far as everybody's concerned there is no such thing 
Oh, but there is. And it's communicated by God from Genesis 5 forward. And explicitly and especially in meter. And people don't even know that there is meter in the Hebrew. They've been arguing about it for 300 years. Okay, so, you know, as it were, as a hypothesis, what is this hypothetical doctrine of how God orchestrates time? So in this page, see it's now page three at this point, because um, I'm still working on this, it's all still in draft. Page three and four sort of read you into what that is and how it came to be that there are two sevens in Daniel 9. Not one, two. And therefore Daniel's 62nd week is what Paul's going to play on in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. So he's also playing to Daniel besides playing to Moses. And in between the two of them is Isaiah and Daniel plays on Isaiah in his own meter when he asks for the time grants. He's basically invoking the meter of Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 53 played off Psalm 90. So the point is, is that when we get to Paul with the two sevens and he keeps on mimicking the 14 as you're going to see, by the time we get to Paul you got a 1500 year history of using this meter as a rhetorical style. So it can be vetted, it can be objectively examined, you don't have to play games with the text, you don't have to pretend that the text is worded differently from what we have, for example, in the BHS, that's all I used. And um, this is the GNT, but the GNT is a, you know, almost identical with all the other versions of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 that we have. So you don't have to play games, and a syllable is a syllable. It's really well known in Greek, and in Hebrew it's not so well known, except to the Jews. And so let's just do it the way the Jews did it, and that's all I did. Okay, so the point was is that you can um, go back and forth from the title page, all right, to a section. And then once you're in the section, like at the outline of a passage, we're going to the passage outline here. This is what it's about. It was where I covered my Trinity Anaphora video. Um, you see at the top here, you've got in the verse notes, and then you've got in my document, they're all highlighted in red. In your word version of word, your colors might be different. But they're all underlying links to different sections of the document. So you can tool around really easily like you see me do now. Okay, but your colors might be different because I have set my colors of links to be in an egregious fuchsia, which is what you're seeing on screen now. So it'll stand out from whatever text somebody else is using. But anyway, that's how you tool around the worksheet, by using these little underlined sections. You see, you get a little tool tip telling you where it's going to take you once you put your um, mouse on the underline. Okay, you can't see my mouse cursor but you can see the little tool tip there. All right. So now let's get into the actual passage so I can show you the overview of what Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is as far as the meter goes. Okay. Now I'm going to hit you with it up front and then we'll show you why basically the argument why it's true. Paul is saying right here the Christ is 56 years old when he writes this is a convention that's been followed since Moses you write words and then when the paragraph is suddenly divisible by seven it's a dateline for your first paragraph of what you're writing okay and Paul is following that convention Isaiah used it also in Isaiah 53 and Daniel uses it in Daniel 9 and um, in order to see that you're gonna have to go to um, let me go back to the title page. Um, you're going to have to go back and look at this part where it says associated documents and web page links. And I have, doc I have listed all the links on this topic that I've been doing for the last, well now, seven years. Um, so that you can, like for example, here's for Daniel. You can pull it up and get the actual meter map of Daniel in Hebrew. And, and check it out yourself. Um, oh, please go. So here we are back at the actual meter of Ephesians. 
and I'm going to review what this actually means. My mouse is slowing down. Uh, what it means so that you can understand this. Like I just said, the first paragraph is divisible by 7, and in this case it's 56. And Paul is saying, hi, Christ would have been 56 years old in the year he's writing. Now, compared to our, that's his version of Anno Domini. Our version of it has got a three-year variance because there was an argument about how old Rome was at the time Christ was born. And that argument was actually going on amongst the Romans, too. So Paul is saying, hi, it's 56. Now, that ends up being, of course, scholars generally think that Ephesians was written somewhere 58, 59. So you're going to have about a two-year variance with this 56 here and a 66 there. It's still really uncanny for what we know of history, and that's why Paul is doing this. Okay? The first thing he's doing, he's mixing meters. When you have a 10 and a 20 like this, that's epic Greek meter. They like to assemble things for epic Greek meter in 10 and 11 syllables. Why, I don't know. I haven't done enough study yet to understand how that works, but I know that they do it, and you can find that on the Internet pretty easily enough. But when he does sevens like this, okay, that's Hebrew meter. Hebrew meter divides into sevens. And the first paragraph, the whole paragraph that is evenly divisible by seven, because you'll notice 10 is not divisible by seven, 20, 27, 37, 47. It's not divisible until it gets to 56. That's a dateline, okay? So Paul is saying something sotto voce about Christ's first 10 years when he says this. He's not only saying what you see in the text, and that's exactly the way Moses had done it too, is that there's a message underneath the text, the meter is telling you something about the text that's like dual entendre. Okay, well, what's dual entendre about the first 10 years Christ was alive? Okay, what's dual entendre is that, that he himself is learning to, to, you know, praise the Father. I mean, he, that's the first 10 years of his life. Then he becomes a man at age 20, according to Jewish law. Okay, that was when you were eligible for military service. And he had to master you know, his understanding by then, all right, which he did. And so this is kind of cute. He became, he was the Lord at birth, and he fulfilled his role, as it were, inside his head by the time he was 20. I mean, you might come up with other alternative meanings. I'm sure there are many alternative meanings that we're supposed to get out of this. I'm just trying to show you the pattern, okay, the rhetorical pattern. And then who is blessing us, okay, 27. He announces himself as king at 30 because that's when you're supposed to announce yourself as king. Okay, at 27, he's still training for it. And who's doing the blessing? Father's blessing him, isn't he? See, Christ is our prototype. My pastor said that a thousand times. Okay, so it's got this evocative of his own lifetime history going on here. Okay. 37, he's dead by 37. He was supposed to live to age 40. He ends up dying at age 33 because the Jews rejected him. Okay, and so at that point, he himself is experiencing and has experienced every spiritual blessing. And who's in heaven but Christ himself? So we were, were in him at that point, you know. And I like the way Paul broke this because, you know, in passe, that's three syllables. He announces himself as king. And you run the syllables together because of the, the vowel running together. So by the time you get to eulogia, he's there. He's already there. He's died. He's gone to heaven. He is the blessing. So every spiritual blessing can therefore be given us because he himself is in heaven. You see the irony underneath this? And this is very common to Greek literature. Okay, they pick apart words like this. We in America think that that makes literature boring. But, but the ancients didn't do it that way. They thought this was what made literature exciting, that you could take each word and pick it apart and find dual entendre, triple entendre in it. Okay, so this is very meaningful to the audience Paul wrote to, and it could be meaningful to us if we learn to think the same way. All right? 
So then we get to 47, and that's evocative because when Christ was 47, he sh first of all, he should have been 40 when, when he died instead of, instead of 33. And I go through that in the, the other associated um, web documents that were back on page 5. So you're just going to have to take my word for it right now just to get the idea. So by 47, when he would have been 47, all right, everybody living in heaven with him, that could have been us. Okay, that would have been, what, 14 years after he died. And it would have been it's seven years after he should have died. All right? See, the point was he should have died at age 40. Then the times of the Gentiles would have begun. That would have been 50 years. That was already in the, in, in the Mosaic Law, which I explain elsewhere in this document and in other documents that you can, that you can find linked on page 5. Um, so it's really poetic to say that he would have been 47 because at 40 he should have died. There would have been um, the 50 years for harvesting the Gentiles next. So se seven years later could have been church's own maturation, which it wasn't, but it could have been. All right? So church could have matured really fast and should have, but didn't. And that's going to end up being Paul's theme here. Okay, so then he gets to 56, and 56 is extremely evocative as a meter ever since Moses because it means the vote is short. This, the voting period is 70 years. 56 means that there's 14 years left. You're going to be in trouble, Israel. That's how Moses ended Psalm 90 with a 56 syllable segment of time. Paul is picking up on that in order to play off Moses. He's also picking up on that because Daniel used it in the same manner. Um, and Daniel specifically asked for the 62 weeks in Daniel's own meter, which you can't see in translation. So Paul is playing to Daniel. And then, of course, 56 was a major uh, paragraph function um, in Isaiah 53. He uses it very prominently to show that under Manasseh and after um, the temple goes down, Israel's vote is going to be short, okay, which is why Daniel prays in the 49th year, okay, and I realize all this stuff is just kind of going over your head right now, but I'm, I'm, I've got to find some way of explaining what this is, and then you can go do the research with all the links that are provided for you on page 5 to know what the heck I'm talking about if you want to do that. All right, so, we, so we're starting, just understand this, we're starting at year 56 on Domini by Paul's accounting. All right? 21 years after that, 21 means temple building, and that's the, the meter that Psalm 90 uses, the meter that Isaiah uses only once, and the meter that, that um, Daniel also uses only once, but Psalm 90 uses it like seven times in combination. Okay? And so Paul, again, is playing to that number. 21 years was the number of years that it would take Israel to build, rebuild the temple. Psalm 90 already forecast that as a problem. Isaiah depicted it in a series of 56s and 70s. And Daniel, of course, is praying in the 21st year, well, in the 49th year, when there are 21 years left to go. And Paul is playing off Daniel, so that's why he's using 21 here. He's, he's equating church to being the temple, which, of course, we see in chapter 2 of Ephesians, but you don't know how he gets to chapter 2 in translation. He's getting there by using the meter. So he's saying, okay, 56, we go an epic 11 more syllables, 10 more syllables, using the Greek, epic style, and that takes you to 66, what we should be calling 66 AD. Now, 66 AD, even in the way we count it, was when the, the, uh, the rebellion in Judea became a historical item. And most of your historians today will call that period from 66 to 73 AD, which culminated with the downfall of the temple. Um, your earlier historians will call that 64 to 70 AD because they're using a different rounding nomenclature. Okay, and you, you know, both of them are correct. They're talking about the same historical period. Well, Paul is too, because when Christ was 33 years dead, 
that was 33 years after his death. The tribulation was expected to begin then, and it was expected in those days to end with the termination of the temple. They expected the tribulation to begin either, you know, seven years prior or to begin at the 73 year mark, all right? Because of church, it was an up for grabs kind of thing. But the old schedule for when the temple was supposed to fall would have been here. Okay? So people were speculating. That's why you got the book of Thessalonians. That's why you got the last half of Peter, which is written right here. Because Paul dies right here, which is what we call 68 AD. Okay? So Paul is basically playing, what if the rapture happened when he does this? So he starts at 56, pregnant introduction, and then he immediately goes into all the rapture speculation, which of course we already know he was dealing with in Thessalonians and Corinthians, etc. Mm -hmm.